Hello, um, I am uh, E. Foyle, uh, as, as Rebecca has just said, I'm an archaeologist um, by training with um, Historic Environment Scotland, um, and before that with the Royal Commission on Ancient Monuments, and um, the, whereas now my job is largely to do with community engagement and encouraging people in local communities to explore their heritage for themselves and um, uh, enable them to, to do so, sometimes it's really rather nice to actually just do a little bit of research and poking about into our history and prehistory. Um, tonight's talk, I have to say that I am slightly out of my comfort zone. I'm coming at this as a field archaeologist, and uh, there's quite a lot of history and early Irish and Anglo-Saxon texts that are involved in the background here. And I am really standing on the shoulders of giants and talking about this because much of the work has been done by other scholars. One or two of you, I think, are in the audience, which is a bit scary. But um, so we'll start, we'll see how we get on, okay? Um, where do I start the slideshow? From the beginning. Right, okay. Um, so uh, I realised immediately that I forgot an introductory slide and it's a mandatory one in Historic Environment Scotland to have the, the organisation's logo at the front. So oops, maybe we can edit that in later. But um, I'll start here in Edinburgh Castle or looking up at Edinburgh Castle. For There's a poem written uh, in perhaps the seventh century about a gathering around about 600 AD of 300 warriors from all over Celtic Britain from if you like what we call Pictland, um, from across in, in Western Scotland, from North Wales and from Cumbria. And they all gather at Dunachin, the fort that stood where Edinburgh Castle now is. And they spent a year and a day, I think it was a year and a day, um, feasting, boasting, drinking, um, really kind of winding themselves up for an attack on the Angles in Northern England. And after the year's up, they ride out and they ride south uh, to a place called Catrice, which may be Catrick in Yorkshire, and uh, they are all slaughtered. Um, and uh, so the, the, the poet Aneirin says that he alone survives and uh, lived to tell the tale. So he writes this praise poem for all these fallen warriors. Now, what's happening there is that the Anglo-Saxon uh, settl settlements um, in uh, eastern and northeastern England are slowly pushing, inexorably it seems, into uh, Western Britain and Northern Britain. And that's what our story tonight is all about. It's one about one of the, the turning points of that story. So, what do we know about um, uh, this battle of, which is variously called the Battle of Dunachtin, Dunachtin, the Battle of Nechtensmere, or the Battle of Dunikin. Um, one source is uh, the Venerable Bede, uh, a cleric in uh, Northumbria, and um, wrote um, an ecclesiastical history of the English people in about 731, I think it's published. And um, he writes, he gives the date of the battle as the 20th of May, 685 AD, which was a Saturday, and writes, indeed, the very next year, the king rashly took an army to ravage the land of the Picts. The enemy feigned flight and lured the king into narrow passes in the midst of inaccessible mountains. There he was killed with the greater part of the forces he had taken with him. The Annals of Ulster, uh, which is a 15th century text that we have now, but it probably drew on a, a long lost chronicle from Iona, records that the Battle of Dunechton on the 20th of May, a Saturday that is, in which Egfrith, son of Oswy, king of the English, having completed the 15th year of his reign, was slain with a great body of his soldiers. The Annals of Tegernach, uh, another uh, also derived from the Iona chronicle, adds, gives the same detail, but adding that the Picts were led by Bridi, son of Belly, king of Fortru, and we'll come back to Fortru again and again in this talk. The Historia Britonum, 
which is a, a later text from an early, another early source, says, this Egfrith is he who made war against his cousin, that's Fratruelem in Latin, Brood, king of the Picts. There he perished with all the best of his army, and the Picts with their king were the victors. The Northumbrians have never managed to exact tribute from the Picts since the time of that battle, which is called Gwaith Lin Garan. It's the strife at Lin Garan. Lin Garan means Crane Lake. Yeah. And sim later on, till Simeon of Durham in the early 12th, 12th century, provides us with the name Nechtensmeer, quod est stagnum Nechtani, that is to say, Nechtens Lake. Yeah. So We've got Nechtensmeer, which is the English name for it. It's come down to most of us. Um, the, we know that uh, Egfrith is killed, that Briddy, king of Fortru, and or king of the Picts, was the victor. So, the combatants. Uh, just some, I've just got some, I assume that most people watching this talk know much more about uh, the Picts than I do. But uh, we'll remember, I'll just show you some slides as a way of introduction and a refresher, that they are, of course, known for their uh, uh, symbol stones with these symbols that nobody can today can really uh, un uh, uh, understand. We find mostly it's what survives as monumental sculpture. We've got the, 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 the rock um, bottom left from Inverurie, which is what we call a class one symbol stone is six early seventh century. It doesn't have a cross or any Christian iconography on it. This one has Ogham down the side of it. And we've got these two symbols of a serpent and a kind of a Z rod and a, and a, 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 a crescent with a V rod. Um, we, slightly later, we get um, uh, symbols appearing on cross slabs, on the back of cross slabs usually. Uh, this one is from Elgin Cathedral. And we also, to remind us that this, these may have been things that were, you know, part of their daily life, perhaps, we have a silver plaque from uh, Norrie's Law in Fife, um, one of the, the few remaining pieces of what was, by all accounts, a, a, an enormous hoard of silver that was all melted down in a hurry in the 1820s or thereabouts, and that has a Pictish symbol on it. That's about, I think it's about kind of three, four, five inches long, three, four inches long. So we have their symbols. Um, what these symbols mean, we don't really know. They may have been the equivalent of the clan badges, if you like. Um, Gilbert Marcus has uh, suggested that, uh, that to the Picts, these became a sort of, it, it was their way of sort of specifying that they were not Roman. Because amongst the, the peoples of, of, of Britain in the post-Roman centuries, most of them still cleave to the idea of being Roman citizens, or at least them. Um, inheritors of Roman culture, but the Picts didn't, and this may have been their way of saying what we are different, expressing their difference. Pictish houses. Um, we don't, the much probably many of the Pictish settlements are under the places that we live, and we're not going to find their houses because we've squidged them all. Um, they, we do, though, in, in marginal lands, we find a, a, a category of house across uh, Angus and Perthshire, limited to them, those two counties, I think, still. Um, which have uh, proved to, to be of a uh, Pictish date. Uh, we know these as Picarmic houses after a tight site in Strathardle and Perthshire. Um, and my colleague there is an awfully tall guy, he's about six foot two or something. So it really is a big long house. Uh, I think it's about 30 meters, it's at 100 feet in length. Um, and it's a big kind of sort of slightly bulbous, uh, round ended um, rectangle. Um, and uh, just in front of my colleague, there's a dip, you may be able to see it, a dip in the heather, which um, on field evidence, we would suggest that it used to, uh, was a, a buyer drain perhaps, and that we were perhaps looking at some kind of uh, early form of buyer dwelling. And uh, here's another example or two, uh, up in uh, the Alt Cossack, which is across Glengarry from Blair Athol, up in the hills there, near Fincastle. And we've got a couple of these houses that sort of, sort of slightly baggy date box shape here, one here. Uh, there's another one there that I can't see. I think it's in there. And it's up surviving in the same sort of horizon as we find prehistoric hut circles surviving from, from uh, probably the late Bronze Age when the climate was um, uh, hospitable enough to allow uh, cultivation up in what is now Moorland. And then you can see, you can see lots of cultivation rigs uh, around that and these little um, pimples 
which are heaps of field cleared stone, probably associated with the hut circles rather than with the Pictish house, but we can't be certain. Here's a Pictish house under excavation. Uh, this was made back in the mid 90s at uh, 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 Pictarmic. And uh, the guess that the, the dip down in the center was a drain proved to be correct. This one seems to have been the drain run almost the full length of the building. Um, and it may just have been one very large buyer. Again, huge, big, long thing over 25 meters uh, in length. And uh, these uh, radiocarbon dates from this site established that uh, this sort of site uh, is in use in the 7th, 8th century, the, uh, the time that we refer to as Pictish period. Okay. Um, and the Picts leave us, again, their other kind of singular method of burial. Um, we have, I don't know how many, I forgot to count them, um, uh, Pictish cemeteries, they are characterized by having a mixture of square and round barrows. Uh, usually the barrows are uh, edged by a ditch. Where the barrows are square, the ditches invariably have a break at the corners, a causeway if you like. So we've got four short lengths of ditch and some in the, uh, uh, the round ones often are often have a penannular ditch with one, just one break. Uh, there's a plan of that one. There we've got square barrel with the four breaks there and uh, the, the causeways are not the breaks in the ditch is probably there and not, not as apparent uh, on, on that plan. Um, one of these circular ones was excavated in the 1950s and we'll come back to that in just a wee minute, but this is at Pityulish uh, just on the spade, the spade is just out of shot uh, down the slope to the left there. Um, oh, they should all come up at once. We, there we are. Um, that's on the left is a map of known ditch barrow cemeteries. It's, those of you who know something about them will tell me that it's out of date, uh, sorry. Uh, the, the red ones are the ones that are upstanding and the yellow ones are the ones that are only known as crop marks, that is the ditches and sometimes the burials as well um, appear in time of drought or under certain conditions of crop growth. And there we can see the site here, we've got a mixture of square and round barrows and here's one excavated back in uh, quite a while ago now um, in, in Angus um, where you've got the graves there in central graves and the barrow, square barrow, round barrows there, okay? Um, and the radiocarbon dates that we're getting for these um, come out, a, are coming out up to about something central in the sixth and seventh centuries AD. Some of them are a bit earlier. Um, these seem to be peculiar to ditch barrows, mostly to, to what we now call pickland, although there is a scattering of them down in the southwest. And, they may have antecedents in, in some Iron Age burial uh, traditions. There's a, a group in Yorkshire that um, is often pointed at as, as, as being some, you know, sort of forerunners, if you like, of this, this method of burial. But it is largely a curiosity of Pickland. We don't know who gets buried there. We don't know how many people, what proportion. We don't know what you had to do to get, because they tend to be single intimations, and there really aren't enough of them to... Um, to uh, uh, account for the population at that time. There's been quite a lot of work uh, done in recent years on them. And we're getting some new dates coming out of uh, uh, the, the material um, sampled in uh, earlier excavations. And um, this slide was led to me by Juliet Mitchell, who's just finished a PhD looking at uh, ditch barrow cemeteries. Um, this is Pityulish here. Um, and that's just showing you that the excavation drawing, there were bits, parts of the skeleton were found in the, in, in the central grave. And that's now been re, uh, radiocarbon dated and it's sort of um, seventh century, she said, having forgotten. We'll move on. <laughs> so on the other side, we have Egfrith, King of Northumbria. Now, it looks very bold and certain, doesn't it, Northumbria? And it's got frontiers in this map, um, hasn't it? Which uh, uh, is probably not like it was at all. We have emerging in the the sixth century in the area of in northeast England. We have two um, kingdoms emerging: the Kingdom of Bernicia, which is centred on Banborough, 
pictured here top right, although it probably didn't, they didn't, well, it didn't look like that then. Um, Bamber there, and then to the south is the Kingdom of Deira, centred on York. And then south of that, we have other, other uh, Anglian and Saxon kingdoms, Lin Lindsay, and uh, further to the, the, the West Midlands, we have the Kingdom of Mercia. Um, Egfris, can pictured here, um, and uh, the, the Northumbrians were steadily at this time pushing north into the Lothians and west into Galloway and west across pressing the Britons of Cumbria and into, in, in, into Lancashire and also making war on uh, as, as far west as, as, as Gwynedd and as we'll see across to Ireland and up, up into Pictland. Um, we can get yeah, some Yes, we'll see there. Uh, so that is not, they'll, those bright, the, 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 the contrast between the bright orange and the green in that last slide shouldn't be taken the, 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 to think that we're dealing with any fixed boundaries. This was probably a constantly changing and fluid situation. And uh, the battle, so we have in the, in the battle, the Picts led by Brady, um, who is here, against Egfris, who is here. And they seem to be cousins because the annals call them fratrelles, which, is Latin for um, uh, cousins. It actually means cousins who are descended from two brothers, but it could also come, it also came to mean cousins who are descended from two sisters. And Egfris is uh, the is, is, uh, mother, was uh, the daughter of Edwin of Deira, and it may be that Bride's father married another daughter, and that, that is how that's pro probably the most likely way in which they were related. Now, oh, stop. It stopped. Um, I, I put some dates here, and I'm just going to run through these quite quickly because I want to show you just how this kind of this these this was a very kind of violent, I suppose some might say, heroic society. But there are a lot of kings being deposed and killed. I think Egfrith's uh, father Oswy is, if I'm right, the only Northumbrian king of the seventh century who manages to die in his bed. Everybody else gets murdered or killed in battle, okay? But it goes back to uh, Athelfris. We go back to that, who was the king of Bernicia. Now he ousts Edwin, who was his brother-in-law from the era and rules Northumbria, uh, uh, rules the whole of Northumbria as, as, one, as one polity. Um, he's killed in 616 and Edwin returns. Athelfrith's sons, that's Oswy, Oswald and Ianfrith, flee to the Picts and to the Scots and stay there for, for years, uh, grow, growing up there, I suppose, with presumably some of their loyal uh, followers. Um, in 633, Edwin is killed by Penda, King of Mercia, which is now what we call the West Midlands. And Athelfrith's son, Ianfrith, comes back to Northumbria. He only lasts a year. He's succeeded by his brother, Oswald, and Oswald, this is important, Oswald seems to have been with the, 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 the Scots of Belrieta. He brings monks from Iona and founds the monastery at Lindisfarne. And that becomes a, a very important um, uh, monastery in, 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 in influential in the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, in 638, Oswald is besieging, is recorded as besieging Edinburgh, the, where we started this talk. Um, and presumably takes it, and the Northumbrians are now in firm control of, of Lothian. He's also pushing out into uh, the west, but he is killed in 642 by Penda of Mercia at Oswestry. Okay, lots of people being killed. So 642, Oswe, who's here, uh, he's ruling uh, uh, 642 to 670, he rules uh, Northumbria, succeeding his brother Oswald. Oswe kills Penda and subjugates the Picts in about 655. And he installs his nephew, Talarkin, or the man who may be his nephew, as king, who rules there from 657 to 661. Now, it's been speculated that Ianfris, uh, 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 Talarkin is recorded as Talarkin's son of Ianfris, and it might be the same Ianfris, it might be Ianfris uh, took refuge amongst the Picts when uh, he fled um, uh, after his father's uh, death. And uh, the Talakan may have been his um, uh, Talakan may have been his son. So he's being put in as a subject king by Oswy. Yeah? In 670, Egfrith succeeds his father 
and then a year or two later, he's uh, up probably in Pictland, um, uh, uh, putting down a rising led by Drust, king of the Picts. Drust is expelled, and he's replaced by Briddy, who's Egfrith's cousin. Yeah. Now, Egfrith's, uh, Briddy's brother, I should point out here, is uh, Owen, who becomes king of Alclude, that is the Barton Rock, the kingdom that later becomes a, the much larger kingdom of Strathclyde. And their father was Belly, who also appears to have been king of uh, Dunbar Dumbarton. So we've got in this family here, right, a whole lot of royal connections. These people all knew each other, yeah? They're making alliances. They're, they are uh, submitting to whoever happens to have the strongest force and be able to impose his will on the others when they have to. But they are probably looking for a chance to assert their independence and strike out on their own, um, given uh, half an opportunity. So quite a fluid uh, situation. And the boundaries of their territories and their kingdoms and their boundaries of their authority is going to be quite a transient thing. It probably dies with them. The successor is really going to have to, uh, he's not going to have a, 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 an organized state machinery that will smooth his, his succession. He's going to have to, to fight for that and fight for his boundaries. And there will be other people looking, uh, to, looking for some pickings, I'm sure. So, Briddy, uh, he's this kind of subject king, and we have got records in the Irish, mostly in the Irish channels, of various acts of violence in the next few years. In 676, many Picts are drowned in Loch Awe. Maybe they were going west to attack, that was at the Picts attacking Dalrieta. In 681, we have the Siege of Donotter. In 682, the Orkneys were destroyed by Briddy. And he's, he is actually mentioned there, but he's not mentioned in the other in the other instance. Uh, the following year, we've got sieges at Dunad and at Dundurn. We don't know if Briddy was involved in these. We don't know if he was being besieged, say, in Dundurn, or he was besieging it. Um, but it presumably he is in the mix there somewhere. Egfrith, we don't know what Egfrith's part is. We don't know whether Briddy's whether these. Uh, um, he seems to be. If if it is all Briddy, he's he's flexing his muscles here. But we don't know whether he's defying Egfrith and doing this in rebellion or whether he's doing it in concert with him, for him. We just do not know. Egfrith, meanwhile, is looking west to Ireland. And in 684, he attacks Finsne Finsnechta, um, sending uh, one of his, um, his, uh, his dukes, dukes, I suppose, uh, leaders, um, and uh, the, the plain of Brega, which is north of Dublin. Finsnecta was king of Tara and high king of Ireland. So Egfrith is attacking him. And I want to read what uh, Bede, uh, if you can read that, Bede, um, this is my university text still, um, what Bede um, uh, said about that year, because this really has a bearing on how this story really comes down to us. Um, Get the right page. In the year of our Lord, 684, King Edfrid of the Northumbrians sent an army into Ireland under the command of Bercht, which brutally harassed an inoffensive people who had always been friendly to the English, sparing neither churches nor monasteries from the ravages of war. The islanders resisted force by force as well as they could and implored the merciful aid of God, praying heaven long and earnestly to avenge them. And although those who curse may not inherit the kingdom of God, one may well believe that those who were justly cursed for their wickedness quickly suffered the penalty of their guilt at the hands of God, their judge. For in the following year, King Egfrid, ignoring the advice of his friends, and in particular of Cuthbert of blessed memory, who had recently been made bishop, rashly led an army to ravage the province of the Picts. The enemy pretended to retreat and lured the king into narrow mountain passes where he was killed with the greater part of his forces on the 20th of May in his 40th year and the 15th of his reign. As I have said, his friends had warned him against this campaign, but in the previous year he had refused to listen to the Reverend Father Egbert who begged him not to attack the Scots, who had done him no harm. And this was his punishment, that he now refused to listen to those who tried to save him from destruction. Henceforward, 
the hopes and strength of the English realm began to waver and slip backward ever lower. So we have the eclipse of Northumbrian power. That's, that's certainly how Bede writing uh, 40, 45 years later uh, sees it. Um, and that again, we've had that slide. I don't need to go through all that again. So I want now that was um, that's the background to the battle. That's the what of the title. Um, what was it? Where was it? Is our next question. And that really has been until 15 years ago was wasn't a problem. It was settled. Everybody knew where it was. It was a, a place called Dunican in Angus. Um, this is uh, a map of, uh, this is from uh, the Arts of Scottish History, which was published in 1996, and it shows some of the provinces uh, that we are said to, uh, the provinces of, 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 of uh, Pickland. It was said um, there are various early texts that say that Pickland was divided into seven areas. Um, uh, one of them, some of them being Strathairn was Menteith, Fife was Fosriff, um, Angus was the Mairns, um, Assel and Gowrie, and so on. Uh, and another text uh, gives also says that there were seven divisions of Pickland, and each was named after one of the sons of Cruisney, who was this mystical founder of the uh, or progenitor of the Picts. And uh, some of these places, like Fib, relate to Fife, Cat to Caithness, Fortla to Assel. But there are other places, one of them, Fortru, comes up, remember, King of Fortru, um, which is uh, in the 19th century, uh, uh, the, the Celtic scholar Skeen. Um, renders as Fortrain, and uh, he identifies it with Strathairn, um, largely because uh, the, there is an incident where the men of, of Fortru or Fortrain are recorded in a battle on the River Erne. So he places it down, uh, Fortrain, down in, 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 in that area between uh, the Force and the Tay. Yeah? Um, so that seemed to be a kind of, you know, that was unproblematic and nobody really doubted that. I certainly didn't when I was a student. Um, and the battle was said to happen at Dunican. Uh, that the, 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 uh, the, the, the attribution of the, of the battle to Angus was made by a guy called um, George Chalmers in his Caledonia, uh, or an account historical and topographic of North Britain from the most ancient to the present times with a dictionary of places. So there we are. And uh, uh, Chalmers um, identifies uh, uh, Dunnechten with Dunnikin, and Dun the name Dunnikin, which had belonged, the, the, the place had belonged to, um, I've forgotten, Abrose Abbey, yeah. Um, and it can be chased back into the uh, charters where you get this name Dunnechten um, appearing much earlier on. Um, so there doesn't seem any doubt that there's a, a Dunnechten there, and, uh, and that's where the battle was. So that was fine. And um, everybody followed that, and it was seen because the king of uh, the king of Fortrain or Fortru is based around here, and uh, he's been you know he's been active up to the Notter, and he's been he's been he's kind of across the across it. Uh, he's been up to Workney as well, but uh, this was very much kind of his territory, and uh, so it's fairly straightforward. This this is from uh, James Fraser's book on the Battle of Dunican, six eight five where Fraser maps out a conjectural route for um, uh, Egfrith's army, um, passing through Edinburgh, going to Abercorn, where he had established a bishopric um, in 681, just four years before. And this uh, Bishop Trumwin was named Bishop of the Picts, although he didn't get base himself in Pictland. It was probably not considered safe. He stayed within uh, Northumbrian territory um, at, uh, on the shores of the first of force at, at Abercorn. Um, so anyway, he marches up. The idea is that he marches up there. He wouldn't have gone through the Carth of Gowrie is the argument. He'd have gone up the river because it was too boggy. Uh, gone up the River Tay, following up the Isla and across and then reaching uh, Dunechton. So this, this route is, is play, played out and Fraser describes uh, the places that he might have stopped at on the way. Um, it's all great fun, but there is no evidence for that. Uh, no evidence at all for how he got uh, to the battle. Um, and when we get there into detail, we've got Dunican Hill here. Um, there has been, over the last century or so, there have been arguments about which side of the hill the battle was, whether it was on Dunican Moss or whether it was on um, 
uh, the west side. Um, where is this Lynn Garan? Could it have been Dunnick and Moss, which is now drained, or could it have been um, what was Rest Tennis Loch, now partly drained, and it's now Ruscobie Loch and the uh, other little little uh, lochens um, up there. But uh, James Fraser maps his route out and uh, has them attacking at 3 p.m. Um, and uh, he has the picks lined up on the slopes of Dunnechton, where Fraser assumes, as many people have done, that there was a fort. Um, on, on Dunican Hill, and that is what Dunnechten is. Um, so this battle is all kind of laid out, and it's all very good, and the, the, the account's really exciting. If you read it, he's, he does a really good job in comparing, drawing in sources and descriptions of other battles to give you this kind of quite, quite, um, quite uh, exciting account of what's, of what's going on. Um, and uh, this is it up here, the battle at Dunican Hill on the right, uh, Turin Hill off in the distance, and that's the edge of Forfar, just peeking through on the left of the photograph. And he would have come around to the north of where Forfar is and crossed somewhere here and gone in uh, somewhere in there. The lock and is just behind that, those, those trees, if you can. I don't know how, how well you can see that screen. Um, so, and three miles away uh, in Aberlanwood Churchyard, we have the famous um, uh, it's, uh, cross slab which has it, or it's got our Pictish symbols on it. And then there is this, this battle scene below. Okay, battle scene, I'll zoom in on the battle scene. And uh, people have studied over this and they've identified that we have got two sorts of people. We've got Picts and we've got Angles. And uh, later in 1982, this helmet of iron and brass is found at the bottom of what was probably a well in York. And uh, so the Coppergate helmet, and that's got this nose piece, see, like these guys here have, yeah? So these, the story is, are the angles, and the guys with the long hair are, uh, they're the picks, yeah? And up here, we seem to have, uh, we've got a pick carrying a sword, chasing an angle, who has cast away his shield, yeah? He's fleeing. Um, uh, interestingly, I'm reading about this and there's comments that he's riding a Pictish horse that he presumably had grabbed or commandeered in the battle. Um, I'm not sure if that is that because I'm not sure whether that's because the tail of this one isn't docked but the other uh, supposed angles here have got riding horses with docked tails. See that? Lots of detail in there. Anyway here in the middle row we've got three rows of infantry um, and then we've got spearmen there in coming in behind the guy with a sword and a shield with a kind of pointed boss on it. And there's an angle um, charging at them. Is this the Anglian cavalry um, uh, charging at, uh, at, at, at Pictish infantry? Uh, and then down here, we've got a pick doing battle with an angle. And then in the corner, we have got an angle, if we're getting for right there, being is, is presumably fallen, he's lying on the ground, and he is being pecked at by a raven, right? The carrion have come down. This man. This man is um, is is dead, and the idea is that that's King Egfrith. Now, this the the details in this in this um, uh, stone have been used. It's assumed it's about the Battle of um, Nechtensmere, and it is also assumed that uh, that uh, the, these are the angles, and that the, this this stone has been James Fraser does a, 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 a very a very good job of reading this stone and interpreting it to reinforce the story of the battle and fit it to the topography around Dunican Hill. And um, one thing that we can say with certainty is that they know that the angles, if these are indeed the angles, are all shown mounted, and it's quite likely, and that's certainly Fraser's argument that uh, Egfrith's force was a cavalry one. That it's not you shouldn't think of him bringing a huge invading army. What he is bringing uh, are probably his household um, retainers. Yeah, probably young men um, looking for adventure and plunder and a fair amount of violence as well. I should think um, uh, who will attach himself to the king and serve him and so on. And that's what uh, that's what uh, we we imagine that these are what we, uh, we, 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 we as far as we know that's what. Uh, rulers of that time would have attracted around them. And maybe when they retired and settled down and had families, they would have been given estates by their, their king for, as a reward for their service, but would perhaps still have been liable to be called up. Um, we don't know how big this Anglian force was. Um, there is um, 
Uh, there's one reference to a battle on Strathcarran, I think, in the seventh century, where something like three hundred men of Dalriada are killed. So, you know, if that then it's said to have been half the force, I can't remember quite remember the details. But uh, uh, Fraser argues that maybe five hundred to six hundred people uh, came mounted, mounted men came north with uh, with Egfrith, and that that maybe what we're, we're kind of looking at there, rather than, it's not an invading force. This seems to be, whatever his quarrel was with Briddy, he is coming to sort him out. He's not coming to conquer and settle and drive the, the Picts out. He's coming to sort out his cousin, who's just got a little bit above himself. It's just gone disastrously wrong, you know? So, so there's Dunican Hill, this is it in the lower slide, uh, looking across Rescobi Loch, which Fraser and others have argued would be uh, Lynn Garan, Crane Lake. Um, that's the hill, the battle would have been fought on the slips off, uh, slopes off to the right. And there again, we've got that picture showing the panorama. Now, going back again to Bede and his... Um, lured him into narrow mountain passes what was there? i need to get can i get the right words if you don't mind i will go back one or two uh, i'm going back too much haven't i never mind um uh, luring them into 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 narrow mountain uh passes um these people as this was this uh, this this dunican hill is the site of the battle that was first challenged in 2006 by alex wolf now at st andrews university um who um, so looked at this and he said, you know, these Northumbrians and the people, presumably it was the survivors that told Bede what had happened when word, you know, took word back to Northumbria, they, they were brought up in the Cheviots. Um, they, they, they knew what big hills were. And these, these are not big hills. Um, inaccessible mountains, certainly not. Uh, Leslie Alcock, professor at Glasgow, excused that, but just, it was just exaggeration. They were just bigging it up a bit, you know, to make a make it look a more, like a more terrifying um, ordeal that they'd gone through. But, you know, well, if you don't accept that, then what, you know, you can't just pick and choose, really. Um, it, this does not look like a place where they've been lured into some kind of trap. This is territory that many of the Northumbrians could easily have been familiar with. Um, so uh, it was uh, Alex Wolfe in 2006 in an article, he, um, he started to look around, he cast doubt on this. And he pointed out that there is another Dunachten, and that is up in Bedenoch. And he said, well, what about this one? It hadn't been mentioned by uh, Chalmers. Chalmers probably wasn't aware of it. I think in the early 19th century, probably the Highlands are a place where the less you know, less, less said about it, the better. Um, and a scholar down in the central Scotland is really going to re regard this as being a, a wild and rather barbarous place. So the name Dunachton is perhaps unlikely to have come to his attention. Um, so uh, Wolf's argument is, and here we, we jump to, this is Roy's military map because it shows the topography. I've chosen this shows the topography rather nicely. This is Badenoch here. Um, we have King Yusi is around about, it's King Yusi's here now, just about. Don't need to see these. King Yusi's around about here. And, um, no, it's not. It's actually, I'm sorry, it's down there. King you see is there. Uh, King Craig somewhere, King Craig's here. We've got Loch Inch now, and the Inch Marshes extending up above it. And Dunachton is just at, uh, just to the north of, uh, northwest corner of, of Loch Inch. Uh, there's a lodge there now. Um, it has been an estate, the state's been attested there for um, back into, well, but back into the Middle Ages. Um, so we've got this uh, uh, Badenoch here, it's quite a broad strass, uh, ringed by mountains here, mountains here, and from there passes run south or come from the south, depending which way you're going, um, passes coming up from uh, Athol over uh, through Glen Feshy and down here, uh, Glen Tromey and Glen Trim, and then further off to the west there are routes coming into Badenoch and into the Spey, and uh, they are uh, coming up from uh, by way of Loch Lagan, from the area at the top of Loch Lenny, where Fort William now is. Um, important routes converge in, in Badenoch. And the road then 
uh, the route way then takes you on there, following the spade down past Player Aviemore somewhere here, and it, it takes you uh, down into the into the Murray Plain. So important uh, meeting of of routes here, and uh, Wolf argues quite strongly that this would be the place. This is narrow places in inaccessible mountains. This is where um, Egfrith is more likely to have been ambushed if he'd followed retreating um, uh, pips up there. But that raises another question. If Brady was king of Fortru, and Fortru is down in southern Persia, what's he doing up here? So Alex Wolf then looked at the evidence for this, and he points out this: the the, the only real uh, justification for placing for true or for train where he did um, is was was the, this reference to a battle that the men of for true fighting at the River Erne. Well, there's a River Erne, but there are two River Ernes in in um, in uh, in Murray. We've got Strathdearn with the River Findhorn, Findhorn, the White Erne. Um, flows uh, down through Strathdearn, um, just to the north, a little to the north of this, where we're looking on this map just now. And then further east, uh, we have got the, the Deveron, the, the, uh, the Black Ern. So we've got a river, uh, we, we have two river urns up here. They needn't be the one in, in Persia that's being referred to in, in, in the reference at Skeen sites. Um, and there is other evidence that, uh, as Wolf went through all the early texts and so on, that I'm not going to try and explain to you, but the article is in the Scottish Historical Review for 2006, if you want to read it all yourself. Um, and he really points out that uh, he makes a strong argument for, for True being uh, up on in Murray, not down in Persia. Um, at Dunachton Lodge itself, um, the house, I think there are bits of the uh, of the medieval castle tower are, are, are embedded within the, within the current house. But in the garden, there is a Pictish stone here, which has got a kind of horse. And um, they, there we are, yeah, uh, ear, uh, ear and the nose is out there, it's a bit broken. This was being used as a lintel until 19, the 19th century, mid 19th, 1870, I think it was. It was found in a farm setting being used as a door lintel. And it was taken um, and set up in in the garden of the lodge where it still is today. So we have we don't know where it came from, obviously originally, but we've got this. You know, it's you can see hard evidence of Pictish pre presence in that area. But we can imagine that Dunach, uh, that Badenoch is going to be a place that will that would be favourable for settlement at that time. And there's no reason to think it was that the Picts weren't present there. Since Wolf's article, uh, everybody seems to have just immediately accepted uh, the, the repositioning of For True. And it fits in in lots of different ways. Um, Gordon Noble at Aberdeen University started about 10 years ago, it's under that, started a large project to look into the archaeology of the Northern Picts. And he has been excavating various settlements and various forts across the north. Most recently, he has settled on the, the fort at Burghead, on this promontory here. Now this is a, oh, previous. Um, this was, a, a, this is a late 18th century map of, um, of Burghead. And we can see there's the section, we've got this kind of, you know, raised headland at the end, there's a sort of lower ward there and an upper ward there. Uh, and there were absolutely massive ditches running across it until the early 19th century, when they were all filled in and flattened, and the village of Burghead was built on top of them. Um, and uh, it was assumed by, you know, most people say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's gone, you know, it's, it's been fairly well, fairly well trashed. But Gordon has been digging there in the last few years, uh, they started digging there, and he is finding lots of really rich archaeological deposits, which are being threatened by coastal erosion. Um, so where he is, he's trying to dig, uh, dig, dig, dig this and recover this information but from um, excavation before it all goes. But what is emerging is a, an important, very large, important, rich site. And amongst the things, uh, amongst the, the artifacts that, that are emerging and have been emerging in the past from Burghead are these carvings of, uh, and, uh, of illustrations of bulls. There seems to have been some kind of bull cult going, going on there. Very 
macho. Yeah. So um, it, the argument really is, is drawing that not just is, is, is fortune going to be down in, in where Murray is, but that Burghead is its capital. Yeah? And that's, that's the, the, the theme that's being pursued uh, by, by, by Gordon there. I want to come back, though, to um, uh, Bidnoch and um, look at this one site here. What the, how am I doing for time? Oh, look, we're, we're, nearly, we're nearly there, people, we're nearly there. Stay awake. Um, in the middle of this picture, you can maybe just about see it, is the Duke of Gordon Monument on the top of Tor Alvey. It's just there. And anybody driving the A9, which is now over there, up and down the A9, if you're not from this area, well, it's, it's a very prominent landmark as you come around kind of that bend there. Um, and at the foot of it, in just 10 years ago, um, members of NOSAS, the North of Scotland Archaeology Society, were doing some survey work uh, on this estate, Kinrara estate, and they stumbled across what they kind of thought, you know, this, banks, what seem to be stony banks around the top of this hill, and they kind of tentatively suggested that this was a fort. Um, and I asked later why they, why, why they were so tentative about it, and I was the answer that, well, you know, it just seemed surprising that it hadn't been seen before, you know, so there must have been, you know, maybe there was something wrong with it. Um, we, we went there um, a couple of years later, following up their, 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 this news, and you know, golly, there is, there's a four here, and nobody's noticed it before. Um, there's Stony Bank here. Can anybody see this? This, um, if you're not an archaeologist, this may be difficult, but believe me, believe me, if I took you there, you would believe me. Um, Stony Bank there, this is, we're down at the end of it here. And on the other end, Stony Bank, mostly overgrown, running up there. It's about three meters, 10 feet wide. Um, entrance is down off to the left of the camera. Um, there's the monument. Monument. There we are. Entrance probably here, and there's been an outwork. There's a ditch of an outwork and a trace of a bank running across the ridge. Um, but otherwise, this takes up most of the summit of the ridge. There's stony bank that's come. It's run somewhere under here, um, and it's been clobbered by the, con the construction in the 19th century of uh, his lordship's monument. Um, yeah, a fort. It's. Um, it looks much like lots of other forts in in in. Um, that we find in the Highlands, and so perfectly good. Um, and we hope that Gordon will get up there, maybe put a trench into it um, one day. Um, we've had the, the Badenoch Great Place uh, uh, project, which is a, a National Lottery Heritage Fund funded and uh, uh, project um, being run by an alliance of various organizations, including the uh, Cairngorms National Park and um, Badenoch Heritage, who are a community group in the area. Uh, they have um, uh, uh, commissioned this year, commissioned a, 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 a digital reenactor, is that the job title, um, by the name of Bob Marshall to do some reconstructions and he's produced this reconstruction of how the fort might have looked and um, this has been shown, he's, he's shown this with Iron Age style roundhouses in the middle of it rather than, than anything else because we don't know the age of this fort at all, it may be Iron Age, it may, may be Pictish. And there's another view of it with the Cairngorms looking dramatic in the background. But this, so it looks very bold, but this would have been a striking uh, place on, 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 on the horizon, as I'll show you. This is the view from the, 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 the northeast end, looking down the spade, the spade's down in, in the trees below us here on the right. And it's looking down, Abbey Moor is just around the corner outside there. So we're looking down, this is Rossi Marcus Forest here. Um, and we're looking off, off down the spay uh, in that direction. It commands a, 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 a massive prospect, but much more importantly than that, look at the hills on this side. And also we can see the, the, this hills coming down on the other side. This, this is where, this is the, the, the northeast edge of Badenoch, where it pinches in. I mentioned it was quite a broad strath. It pinches in at this point. You've got Craigellachie here, and this is from Google Earth, but it's a little bit exaggerated. I think it's a times two or times three exaggeration, but it makes the point. This is Toralbi. This, uh, the fort's up here. You've got the spay coming down this side, and the slopes fall straight to the spay, and then they start to rise straight away to these hills here. Um, 
There is Loch Alvey is just uh, peeking out from behind Craigellachie there. Um, the only way through is past the foot of Toralvey. This is the main route south from Murray towards, as I said, if you go down via Loch Lagan, down towards Loch Cliny, to Argyll and to Ireland. It's also the main route, uh, uh, this is the main route down into Perthshire. You go past here and there are various passes. I mentioned over the, over the Feshi, the Tromi and the Trim that take you down in, into Athol. Yeah? This is an important point. This is a real pinch point. And this fort must have had, you know, you, it's easy to imagine it to see, uh, having huge strategic importance at the time it was occupied. But as I say, we don't know whether it was 500 BC or 500 AD. Roy's map. This is from the, uh, around about 1750. Roy was uh, surveying for the military. He was looking at this with a, a military mind and so on. This was a, these were maps to, uh, to inform uh, the commanders of patrols in the years after Culloden. Um, and he's thinking about routes and routeways and so on. He shows the topography really well. There's the Spain, right? And you can see there, Toralvi falls to the river and uh, the Nordban, the hill there, does the same. Yeah, there's no real sensible way through there. Uh, the hills come down to Loch Alvey there. Now the A9 is cut through there. Yeah, but between Loch Alvey and Tor Al uh, Alvey, there is a gap of about, there's a, a sort of flat area, about two, three hundred yards wide. Through that, Wade put his military road in 1730, 1729. Uh, in the 1870s, the railway went through there. The later uh, the, uh, road to Inverness in the, early, in the 19th and early 20th centuries ran through there. It wasn't until the late 70s that this, this uh, uh, narrow pass was bypassed and um, uh, the, uh, the A9 uh, passed to the north of Loch Alvey. Um, I would say there, the, the standing at Dunachtin, uh, sorry, on, on to, <laughs> standing on Torelby, it strikes, it struck us when we were surveying it, that um, this is Dunachtin. This is where the battle was. If you're going to ambush somebody, this is the place to do it. Yeah? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stop. I said, don't say Thermopylae, but it come, keeps coming to my mind, you know, where, where Leonidas and his 300 Spartans hold off tens of thousands of Persians under Xerxes in this narrow path between the water and, 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 and the mountains. And uh, that, that's what comes to mind there. This is where he can, he can block off, he can block off the angles and so on, and uh, if, maybe if, ambush them if that's what he did. But this, this is, is the narrow pass. And uh, Dunachtin itself is about five kilometers away, but we are in Albi Parish. And it may be, I would suggest, maybe the estate of Dunachtin extended to here and it's taken its name. The name of the estate center has shifted from here to uh, uh, five miles to the west at some point. Now, I'm not saying that this was a fort or uh, in, 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 in Dark Eta. We don't need to imagine that the fort was occupied at the time of the Battle of Nechtensmere. We, uh, all we need to think is that it was a prominent enough thing. It had perhaps some enough remains for it to be recognized as that and have an attachment to it. You know, so it's Dunachtan's fort, but there's nobody living there. Uh, a, pa a parallel might be an obvious one is Arthur's seat. You know, we don't think that Arthur's living up there anymore. But um, so, um, it, uh, you know, the, 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 there's some recognition that there is a fort, a dune, up on top of that hill and that um, a, it's, 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 a, it's a place that means something to the Irish analyst or the Iona uh, compiler uh, down in, in Argyll. And this then, by that reading, it'd be Loch Alvey, not Loch Inch, that is Lynn Garan, Crane Lake. And that's what I think, really. And uh, the more I think about it, the more I think I'm right. So, um, uh, one, a couple of things left to say, really. The first is that uh, when Alex Wolfe was talking about uh, the, the, the battle in, um, uh, it was in Kincraig at the Badenoch Heritage Festival last September, um, he showed this slide uh, just as an afterthought that um, uh, uh, the, this is the dedication of St. Paul's Church in Jarrow. Egfrith is named as the donor, and he's likely to have been present. 
And that was on the 25th of April, 685, three and a half weeks before he's killed. And rather than, Alex Wolf had just threw out this thought that just maybe, rather than marching or riding north with his 500 mounted uh, retainers, maybe Egfrith got on ships and came round the north of Scotland. And it's just possible that he came up up the coast and round. Perhaps he was making for Burghead. Perhaps he landed somewhere here. Uh, Brady retreated from Burghead up the Spey, up the Spey, and then trapped him or ambushed him at uh, the foot of Taralbi. Just a thought. So the angles could have been going in either direction. Um, the final thing, just to kind of wrap this up, really, is a bit of a, an, uh, uh, another thing I want to remember. This is, this is Toralvi here. Uh, the fort is, I think, up here. I can't really see it on this, but the fort's up on top of the hill here. There's Loch Alvey. And I want you to look there. You can see again, there's where the railway line still goes and the old road still going and so on. But I want you to look at this field here. And there we have it. There are... Um, in the field, there are crop marks. Remember, we talked about the crop marks of the Pictish uh, cemeteries. There's a cemetery here with graves in it and um, square barrow, round barrow, square barrow, round barrow, square barrow. Um, lots of APs done in, uh, especially in 2018, there was a, a really good year for crop marks. And uh, they, oh, let's go back again. Um, I'll come to that in a second. We've got, yeah, uh, the, most of these survive just as, as, as crop marks. There are one or two, we've walked across the field, there are one or two, I think maybe three, where you can actually see something of a barrel left. There's something upstanding and traces of a ditch around it. And we have mapped them. Um, it's a site, it's really been ignored, but it has been known for a while. The Ordnance Survey Map, published in, in 1870, um, as they are, site of tumuli, human remains, uh, sword blades, buckles found here in 1800. Um, now the Ordnance Surveyors made a note, which is here, it says, um, site of tumuli, human remains, sword blades, buckles, etc. found here, AD 1800. This name is applied to the site of several heaps or mounds of earth, situated about one half mile west of Toralbi. About the year 1800, when the field was improved, several portions of human remains were discovered in these mounds, together with pieces of sword blades, buckles, etc. Tradition says there was a battle fought in the vicinity, but the date or who the conflicting parties were is not known. It is now. Um, the, uh, Juliet uh, Mitchell, a colleague, um, has um, I mentioned before, I've been working on a, a Pictish a, a Barrow Cemeteries, has transcribed uh, the aerial photographs that we have to show just how many barrows there were and where they all are. We can make this map of barrows, that's the transcription and that's the, that's, 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 that's the resulting plan. Um, there are about 40 of them all. This is the biggest Barrow Cemetery known in Scotland so far. Yeah? Now, um, you know, if I was, it's it's tempting to think, you know, who's buried there? We don't know much about who's buried there. The grave goods, the swords is a bit, you know, it's a bit odd. We don't normally find uh, grave goods in uh, in Pictish burials. You know, they're Christian. The idea is that Christian, Christian burials don't contain grave goods. But some of the pitiulish that I mentioned before, there's a, there's a what appears to be a knife blade there. And we don't know whether the, the, the bits of iron that presumably came out really were sword blades or not. They don't survive. We don't have any of them. But it's just tempting to think. I think if I was a 30-year-old starting my career, I wouldn't stick my neck out and say it. But it's tempting. I can see it now. It's tempting to think that just maybe this is where the slain of that battle were buried. But I do... I, I, of course, that's unprovable, and therefore I shouldn't be saying it really. But, but um, you know, the juxtaposition of the location, the perfect place for an ambush, the fort, the the um, uh, and the cemetery is just perfect <laughs> in my mind. And so we come back to the um, the the Aberlemno Stone. Um, 
James Fraser, uh, while accepting entirely, and he wrote the first volume of the New Edinburgh History of Scotland, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, up to the up to the eighth century, um, he um, he accepts entirely for truth in the north, like everybody else. That's not challenged at all. But he's he's hanging on to Dunican as being the site of the battle, and part of it says is it's too much of a coincidence that this stone should be just two or three miles away from Dunican. But the answer to that really has to be, we don't know anything about the creation of that stone, who had it made, for why they had it made. Um, we, and although the stone, I, I believe, is consistent with a local origin around Forfar, um, you know, we don't know where it originally stood. Um, and uh, it, it could be, you know, we. As we saw at the beginning, there were many number of battles in those days, and um, you know, we just don't know.